the next coming in our um, case study lecture is named selectivity of binding of vector molecules to the folate receptor alpha observed by molecular dynamics and it will be presented uh, from uh, Professor Anela Ivanova from the Physical Chemistry Department, Faculty of Chemistry Pharmacy at Sofia University. Uh, so I'll ask once again for your attention, this time to uh, Professor Ivanova. Uh, let me first start uh, by saying that this is the team from our lab, uh, the colleagues together with whom we have been working on these projects during uh, the last five years already almost. And uh, I would like to start the talk by saying that we did this computational study in the framework of drug delivery. Uh, we have chosen as our model drug, uh, the same actually chemical therapeutic uh, that Ku was talking about everything. Uh, but uh, the reason to select the chemotherapeutic for the study was that, uh, as we all know, uh, chemotherapy is the most usual treatment of cancer, but together with the positive uh, effects, it has also some very unpleasant, I would say, severe uh, side effects, uh, which are listed here. And uh, one of the main problems with chemotherapeutics is that uh, these aggressive substances, aggressive to our body, they kill the cancer cells, but they also affect in an undesired way the healthy tissues. Uh, uh, one of the strategies to alleviate these uh, undesired side effects is to create drug delivery systems which are based on the so-called active targeting. Active targeting, uh, in principle, means that uh, uh, there are some additional, um, let's say, components together with the pharmaceutic that uh, are able to um, steer it uh, primarily to the uh, tumor cells, to the neoplastic cells, and uh, in this way, reduce the side effects by not affecting the healthy tissues. There are different strategies to achieve this. Um, they are listed here, but I will focus on the implementation of small organic molecules, uh, which are able to, if bound to the drug, they are able to uh, steer it towards a particular part of the cell membranes, and then uh, targeting usually a membrane embedded receptor. And then sometimes in our case, together with part of the membrane using endocytosis, uh, the drug is um, internalized into the uh, cytosol of the neoplastic cell uh, cells. Um, this is the pair of uh, protein that we selected to test whether we are able to describe compute computationally this uh, targeting affinity of the, the protein. Uh, the ligand is the well-known folic acid. Uh, which uh, in the human body at physiological conditions is doubly charged, and the anion is uh, usually called the folate. Uh, the native receptor of this ligand in the human organism is the so-called, well, it has several native receptors, but one of them is the so-called folate receptor alpha, which is the crystal structure, which is depicted here. On the screen, uh, this is the primary transporter of this ligand across the cell membrane. Uh, and uh, we decided that it's a good pair to study, not only for several reasons. One of them is that uh, this receptor is overexpressed mostly on uh, the surface of cancer cells. Of course, it is present also on the normal tissues, but in very, very much lower quantity than on the cancer cells. Uh, also, uh, it is uh, available not only on certain type of cancer cells, but on many types of cancer cells. Uh, and um, it has been reported that the overexpression can reach from 100 to even 1 million times compared to the healthy cells. 
Another advantage of this pair is the high affinity of the ligands for this uh, receptor. Uh, here you can see that the association constant is rather small. Also, uh, the receptor is rather small, which from computational perspective is an advantage. It has a well-defined crystal structure, which was published several years ago, and which we used as the basis for our models. And also folate, the natural ligand, it's simple. It's an um, uh, organic compound with, um, um, let's say, standard uh, functional groups in it. And it's simple and abundant also experimentally. This was the reason to choose this pair. And what were our goals? First, we uh, decided to describe the molecular structure of a series of folate-like vector ligands in uh, saline. Uh, not only the folate, but also uh, some of its derivatives, which could have the potential of steering uh, some drugs to the folate receptor alpha. Uh, the second goal of the study was to construct a model cancer cell membrane uh, with an embedded receptor and to simulate its dynamics. So these were the two preparatory steps for the actual uh, part of the study. Uh, then we monitored by molecular dynamics link of this uh, set of ligands to the folate receptor alpha and uh, characterize their interactions and uh, try to rationalize uh, the selectivity of binding of these ligands to the particular protein receptor. And finally, we tried to assess the effect uh, drug cargo to the targeting ability of these vector molecules. And all the, the stages of this study were uh, carried classical atomistic molecular dynamics simulations. Uh, a bit more details about the models. Here is the set of ligands that we tried to that we decided to investigate. First, of course, is the folate, the folic acid in the doubly um, ionized state. Or, or the other four ligands from this set, they are all D anions, so negatively charged. This is an abbreviation for raltitrexate, penetrexate, and uh, methotrexate. They are uh, available synthetically and they are used as chemotherapeutic on their own. Uh, this ligand here, which we abbreviated MTHF, is another form of folic acid, uh, which is slightly different, but actually it is more bioavailable inside the human body uh, than the folate, uh, uh, which we intake uh, with the food. This ligand uh, is a bit different. Okay, in red, you can see everywhere on the molecular structure, what are the differences compared to the initial uh, folic acid molecule? Uh, so this bond here, which is a pterial ornithine molecule, uh, is different than the others in the sense the only triterionic molecule in the set. It's also uh, synthetically available and was suggested by uh, an, a, a group of researchers as uh, an inhibitor of one of the other uh, folate receptors. So you see the compounds are somehow related, uh, but they also have differences which might affect their behavior uh, toward the receptor. The model membrane, just a couple of words about it. Uh, we tried to construct this uh, model uh, mostly based on experimental data, or I would say as much as possible based on uh, experimental data. That's why our model consisted of uh, 370 lipid molecules distributed asymmetrically, both in, ter in terms of number and in terms of charge, which is typical for the human uh, cell membranes. Uh, and uh, the bilayer consisted of five different uh, types of lipids, which were obtained by combining these uh, lipid head groups, uh, the standard phosphatidylcholines and so on. We also included a uh, higher amount of cholesterol, uh, which is known for cancer cells and so on. I'm not going to go into detail. Here, just uh, I would like to mention that we have several kinds of lipids that are negatively charged, and all of them are situated in the inner leaflet of this um, model membrane. And then we have here the protein receptor, which is uh, embedded into the outer leaflet of the model membrane by uh, um, glycosyl phosphatidyl 
inusual anchor by a GPI anchor. That is what happens also in experiment, according to the literature sources. And uh, you see that, uh, uh, yeah, something else that might be important for the membrane model. Uh, the tails of the lipids were not only saturated uh, alkane uh, residues, but they uh, some of them contained also monounsaturated. Uh, it means with one double bond or with uh, multiple double bonds um, along the uh, hydrocarbon chain. Uh, the composition is practically taken from these two experimental uh, studies. And finally, the protein, uh, it, this is the crystal structure again. Uh, this is the PDBID, which we used for this uh, protein molecule. It consists of 20, 204 amino acids and the overall charge uh, is plus four. Again, uh, the construction of the protein bound to the GPI anchor was based on uh, experimental data. And uh, this GPI anchor serves to immobilize the receptor on the surface of the cell membrane. That's what we did also in the model. Uh, where this receptor is usually found in the so-called lipid rafts, which are rich in uh, transport proteins and different proteins. And as uh, there were experimental measurements that uh, it is usually found either as a monomer or as dimer. So we used a single uh, receptor molecule anchored into the model membrane. And the overall charge of the GPI anchor is minus one. So you, you see, we have a lot of charges in addition to that. That is how the four different types of models uh, that we studied look like. The first one is contains one ligand, one each of the uh, series of six uh, uh, immersed in saline. And we maintained the physiological concentration of sodium chloride. Uh, chloride also in all of the models. In this ligand is immersed in a cubic periodic box and simulated with orthorhombic uh, periodic boundary conditions in the three dimensions of space. This is the first type of models. The second type uh, contains a membrane with uh, one molecule of an embedded uh, protein receptor uh, immersed in water and uh, sodium chloride. And of course, in a larger box here, we imposed hexagonal periodic boundary conditions because this is the normal uh, packing type of the lipids in the membrane. In the third model to this, we also put a ligand in the system, a free ligand unbound, and uh, let it uh, move uh, the model system and observe whether and how it will interact with the protein receptor or with the membrane or what with the components of the model. And finally, uh, we also test uh, performed simulations, uh, almost the same model, uh, with the exception that the free ligand uh, was not anymore free, but we attached a peptide complex, a drug peptide complex to it uh, to test how it will do an attached uh, drug carbon. Just uh, in short, the simulation protocol, atomistic uh, molecular dynamic simulations, later on followed uh, by some additional DFT calculations uh, to assess the binding energy between the uh, protein and the ligand. We used uh, CHARM36 to describe the protein, the sugars, uh, and the lipids. And uh, we used um, and for the ions, and we use CGNFF for the ligand molecules and for the drug peptide uh, uh, for the drug, and uh, for the peptide, of course, CHAM36 again. And water was tip 3 p very standard uh, protocol for the MD simulations, uh, uh, with the exception that uh, we uh, maintained some constant surface uh, pressure on the um, uh, models with the membrane. Uh, corresponding to the surface pressure that is measured for uh, human living cells. And the temperature was um, physiological and the pressure was ambient. Um, here are some details about the MD simulation. I will not go into detail here. If you have questions, we can discuss later. Uh, just uh, the trajectory length. We did uh, 150 nanoseconds for the three ligands, uh, one microsecond for the uh, receptor embedded membrane. 
and um, from 20 to 400 or 500 nanoseconds for the systems containing also ligands. I would like to mention that we also performed four independent trajectories for the three ligands and two independent trajectories for the drug peptide complexes models. Uh, final note on the protocol, we have uh, saved snapshots into the trajectories every 10 seconds. Okay, uh, so the preparatory steps, we wanted to learn more about the ligands and about the membrane themselves with, uh, when they are not together. Uh, I will tell you here that uh, the whole series of ligands turned out to be quite flexible. Uh, folate had definitely judging root mean square deviation of the atoms of uh, folate during the last 50 nanoseconds of the MD simulation. But we can see that it definitely preferred conformations and interchanges between them quite fast. The same is true about PMX, uh, PTX, about PON, and um, the other three ligands, they have more or less one preferred conformation. But nevertheless, all of them are very mobile. Here is some summary of the cluster analysis. And they have at least two uh, preferred uh, structures which are populated uh, in a different share throughout the trajectories. Uh, and we thought that this flexibility might be important for the binding to the receptor. Uh, concerning the membrane uh, and the um, lipid bilayer, uh, as part of this membrane model. Uh, here we perform different try whether we have obtained the correct structure of the lipid bilayer. It seems to be the case. Uh, the thickness of the bilayer expand experimental bounds. Uh, it is also known that uh, in the increased uh, presence of cholesterol, as it is our case, the lipid bilayers are usually in the so-called liquid ordered state. And this analysis corresponds exactly to such a liquid ordered phase state of the membrane. As you can see also for most of the lipids, uh, we have areas uh, uh, per lipid molecule occupied on the surface of the bilayer that are very, very close to the experimental data. The order of the lipid tails is an essential determinant of the phase state of the lipid bilayer. And as we can see from these order parameters of the lipid tails, uh, they, the saturated are the most ordered one. Uh, the more unsaturated are the least ordered one. So the closer to zero these values are, uh, the, the disorder, so the closer to a liquid state uh, the membrane is. And finally, the poly unsaturated uh, fatty acids, of course, they are known to be the most disordered one, ones which is reproduced uh, by our results. The overall picture of this um, uh, lipid uh, tail order parameters corresponds uh, exactly to a lipid order state, a liquid ordered state, sorry. So we assume from this analysis that our uh, model is uh, correct. How about the protein? How did it behave during the MD simulations? Some extracts of the results about the protein structure at half of the trajectory at about 500, at 550 nanoseconds. Uh, this is the X-ray structure. So even visually, you can see that uh, the secondary structure is quite well preserved. Uh, here is the numerical comparison here. Uh, the, uh, structure from the molecular dynamic simulations is very close to the experimental one. There is some unfolding of the helical uh, regions and some slight changes in the secondary structure. But when we did a more careful analysis of the data, it turned out that this um, partial, let's say, unfolding of the protein is uh, caused by uh, interactions of its termini with the lipid molecules from the membrane. Uh, since the experiment was done uh, in the absence of a membrane for the protein as, as it is without a membrane. So we believe that this is uh, okay uh, as a structure of the protein. And here, just uh, to have an impression about the flexibility of the bite, which is in this part of the protein, of the ligand binding site, uh, we have estimated the fluctuations of the volume. 
of these binding pockets uh, during a piece of the trajectory. And this is the experimental value, this here. So you can see that the pocket fluctuates. It's uh, relatively mobile, but uh, the volume predicted by the simulation is very close to the experimental value from the X-ray structure. Up to here, we were relatively sure that our model was fine. And then we studied how the ligands behave in the presence of this um, protein. Just a second. Uh, I think I need the other way to be able to start. So I'm going to show you how each of the six ligands uh, binds or interacts uh, with the receptor. Before showing the movie, I I would like to underline once more that uh, there was no bias in our MD simulations. So we just monitored the natural dynamics of the. Here is the folate. Uh, and here in this movie, we have tried to capture the moment when it binded to the active site, actually. Uh, so these residues here in gray, they represent uh, the ligand binding site of the protein, and folate did not have any doubts where to bind, it uh, went directly uh, to the pocket and bound there. And as you can see from the minimum distance and the protein, uh, the ligand remained there uh, till the end of the simulation. Uh, here is a happened in the four independent trajectories. Well, for folate, the same. In four out of four cases, it went to the pocket uh, and bound and uh, in most of the trajectories, in three of them, it stayed there. Just in the fourth trajectory, it was more mobile and uh, also I'm close to the base of the protein somewhere here. Here is uh, an illustration of what RTX did. Uh, okay, let me play the movie. Well, the same. It found the active site of the protein and down there. Uh, uh, pay attention now it will rearrange for some time and then uh, assume it's just even going away for a while coming back and this is the right pose uh, the correct pose of binding into the active site of the protein which was not the same by the way for the and uh, here is the uh, plot showing uh, the binding time of the ligand and that it remains uh, in the active site until the end simulation. Here is a summary of the behavior of RTX. Yeah, in two out of four times, uh, it uh, was able to identify it and stay there, bind there. But in the other two, so in 50% of our four trajectories, uh, it found an allosteric site on the protein. Uh, this allosteric site, at least to our knowledge, uh, was not reported for the folate receptor alpha. And it is here, just opposite the bind which is given here in dark gray. And RTX uh, is uh, um, uh, immobilized there by uh, the among two clefts of the protein. And it's uh, also a very stable binding pose for this ligand. Uh, OK, oh, sorry. Sorry, sorry, sorry. It didn't share itself. Uh, I'm going to share it again. So for this interruption. But uh, yeah, even from this uh, small number of trajectories, we were able, I hope you see the screen again. Yes, it's visible again. Okay. Uh, we were uh, a good explanation of the relative affinities of the two ligands measured experimentally. It is known that uh, RTX has about 60% for this receptor compared to folate. Of course, we cannot be quantitative, but qualitatively, we were able to explain that this is due to the binding site. OK, so what made these ligands bind at this spot of the protein? We did analysis of the ligand protein ligand interaction in molecular dynamics trajectories. And they showed that it's a co uh, complex of interactions, which were reported also for the crystal structure complex, uh, uh, some by stacking of uh, the aromatic parts of the ligand and some 
uh, hydrogen bonds. Just be aware that these are very persistent hydrogen bonds because we were extracting snapshots at uh, very long intervals of 10 picoseconds from our trajectories. And uh, uh, for RTX, the difference is that the um, most intensive stacking uh, is between the uh, so-called um, sterine part of the ligand and some aromatic amino acids from the pocket. Well, folate, the most intensive stacking is between the middle part of the ligand, the glutamate, uh, um, and also the charged part of the ligand and the middle part of, with uh, some other amino acid residues from the pocket. So they really have two different binding modes, these two ligands. Uh, to, uh, to rationalize this um, difference in the binding, we uh, calculated with uh, DFT, with dispersion correction, presented the snapshots from the molecular dynamics trajectories, taking the structures from there and extracting just uh, um, the ligand together with its very closely lying um, amino acids. So we calculated binding energies, so which are quite strong, as you can see. Of course, this is due to the very intensive electrostatics in the system. And then when having a set of binding energies, uh, we use the components analysis to uh, correlate the, these uh, uh, binding energy values. Here they are scaled down for the purpose of the statistics to analyze descriptors uh, that uh, we saw from the molecular dynamics trajectories that might be important for the binding of the ligand to the uh, number and uh, length of hydrogen bonds, number of uh, contacts, so as a measure of the of Van der Waals interactions, number of staking partners, the partners, number of the electro electrostatic partners, number of closely lying amino acids. And um, here I have highlighted the the most important coefficients of the first three principal components, which were able to explain uh, more than 80% variation of the binding energy, that uh, the two ligands have different, slightly different mechanisms of uh, binding to the protein. Uh, while uh, the folate relies on uh, Van der Waals interaction, on hydrogen bonds, and uh, on electrolytics, but they can be somehow compensative of each other because they are uh, found in the three different uh, principal components. RTX, almost all of the important interactions are concentrated in the first principal component. These are again the number of hydrogen bond dispersion and electrolytics, but acting together at the same time uh, to uh, keep this uh, RTX bound to the pocket. And also they are complemented taking and by the closely lying amino acids. To get a more visual impression on the on the mode of binding, here I have it, uh, extracted some representative interaction maps. Uh, and you see the amino acids from the pocket, which uh, contribute to the interaction with the ligand by Van der Waals mostly. And those are other amino acids which uh, contribute uh, with uh, quite strong, uh, some of them, uh, hydrogen. So it's a really collective interaction of the ligand with uh, several amino acids at the same time uh, to accomplish this uh, bind uh, to the active site of the protein. And uh, by the way, most of these amino acids are the same, which were outlined in the crystallographic uh, of the folate uh, protein complex. Uh, we were able, however, to identify a new amino acid, this arginine 61 was not listed in the crystal structure interaction map, uh, but we saw in the molecular dynamics that it is very important for initially attracting the ligand to the, the binding pocket. Okay, what happens with the other ligand? Here is PTX. Uh, contrary to what we might expect, uh, the similar chemical structure it did not behave in the same way. It neared the pocket, but it never went into it and didn't bind in the cavity. It, it uh, was very much attracted overall to the surface of the protein. Uh, as you can see from the minimum distance, it's really sticky to the protein, but it goes all over the place. 
either to the allosteric site, the same uh, which was registered for RTX, or to the surface, wherever it likes, and scan virtually the surface of the protein. Uh, the uh, some hydrated form of the folate, uh, it resembles the folate itself to some extent because it was able in three out of the four trajectories to identify the protein there, as you can see also here, let it come close to the pocket. But uh, as you can see also from the fluctuations of the minimum distance, the binder is stable as that of the folate. Uh, we attributed this by analyzing the data to the larger volume of this and, uh, which led to the inability of this uh, uh, reduced ligand to fit well into the um, uh, cavity of the protein to be part of or to take part in all of the uh, necessary interactions. But okay, these two ligands were still able to identify the protein and fit. Unlike, uh, okay, what were the uh, uh, respective interactions? Um, yeah, much weaker by stacking. Uh, also, for MTHF, we registered some uh, surface activity. It was um, attracted from time to time by the membrane, which uh, also prevented its stable binding to the, uh, to the pocket uh, uh, of the protein. Uh, as you hear, Van der Waals interactions are much more uh, expressed there, but that's uh, most of it. It is not able to, to form such uh, strong hydrogen bonds as uh, uh, folate in its non-reduced form. While for PTX here in brown, you can see all the amino acids that interact in the four different trajectories that we generated. And you can see also on the interaction map and on the PCA results, they're mostly stabilized by uh, non-specific uh, Van der Waals and electrostatic interactions. So this ligand um, behave in a somewhat different way uh, than the first two, but okay, they still bind to the protein, irrespective of the nature of the binding. And these two, the final two, uh, methotrexate and ferrol ornithin, as you will see from the movie for MTX, it doesn't like the protein. It works much more to bear into the membrane or to stay in the solution. So this is also evident from the table. Uh, we analyze why this is happening, because the MTX has the smallest structural difference uh, than folate, but it turned out that this is enough to make it especially effective and keen to interact with the lipids, with the lipids from the membrane. And finally, the last ligand, uh, the pterial ornithine. Well, it did bind to the protein only in the first trajectory for a very short, for a relatively short time at the end. And you see very far from the pocket, none of the other three trajectories, uh, it stayed uh, close to the protein for a measurable amount of time. Well, uh, of course, this is easily to, uh, explainable. Uh, Pon was the only Twitter ion in the series. So this was an evidence that the double negative chart for these ligands to be able to bind to this receptor. Okay, to summarize the results from, yeah, uh, and spawn since it has um, both a positive and a negative charge, uh, and the protein surface is really uh, highly charged, it just uh, so randomly to uh, some of these charged residues. Okay, but uh, yeah, this is um, proof uh, I just explained to you that MTX very much likes to stay on the surface of the membrane. This is the interface of uh, the outer mon, and uh, that um, it is stable whenever it binds to the protein. Very rarely it stays here at the allosteric site and is stabilized by high, high number of hydrogen bonds. And uh, Pond has, uh, you see, very high number of charged amino acids as uh, the preferred interaction partners on the other side of the protein. Okay, so to summarize the results from uh, the unbound list, they are able to detect the protein, at least some of them. And uh, if I have to, to sort them in terms of uh, 
capability to be uh, or potential to be used as uh, vector ligands for uh, drug cargo, maybe uh, our RTX and folate would be applied first and then uh, followed by um, a PTX and MTHF. So we decided to keep these four ligands and then, uh, they are uh, targeting ability uh, by attaching uh, bioactive cargo. Again, we took from experimental data, uh, biodegrad a biodegradable linker that has been uh, tested experimentally to be suitable, attached to it, uh, a non-covalent complex of the same chemotherapeutic, doxorubicin that Petko was talking about, uh, absorbed on of a specially tailored drug binding peptide. So this is our bioactive cargo and tested by molecular dynamics whether the two ligands will be to carry this system to the protein as they did as they interacted in the free state and here are some short movies this is complex as you can see it goes to the protein but uh, unfortunately okay in much rare the complex goes to the extra site and in none of the cases was the ligand able to bind in the same way to the active site of the protein as it did when there was no carbon. And uh, only the four Professor, yeah. I'm sorry for the interruption, just to mention approaching half an hour. Yes, the next I'm one okay. slide away okay. from thank the end. You. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Nadia. Okay, so yeah. Uh, as we suspected, uh, PTX and MTHF didn't do so well. They were not uh, able even to stably bind the uh, bioactive to the protein. So here is a summary of uh, what we learned from these studies. Uh, we found out that the different ligands have specific structure and shape, and which is important in a way uh, for their binding, but uh, mostly the chemical composition turned out to be the important one for the selectivity of binding. Uh, the membrane maintained a liquid ordered state in all simulations. Uh, the structure of the receptor only locally in solution close to the membrane and only locally when the ligands were bound to it. And uh, I'm not going to read this in detail because I told you about the behavior of the different ligands. Uh, we discovered an allosteric center which attracts uh, most of the folate derivatives but not itself and uh, this leads to diminished specificity of the binding of these uh, derivatives and then um, we found that the cargo the drug complex interferes quite significantly with the steering affinity of the vector molecules and uh, that's why this uh, cargo needs to be tuned carefully uh, to be to enable efficient functioning of the targeting ligands but apart from that uh, we can outline rtx and as the most promising uh, candidates for this targeted drug delivery. For folate, this is known, but for RTX, uh, at least we couldn't find uh, reports so far. And finally, I would like to acknowledge the support, both in terms of funding of the research and of computational resource, and thank you for your attention. If you have some questions, of course, I will be happy to answer them. Well, thank you, Professor Ivanova, for the wonderful and interesting presentation. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? I think it's visible till now in the chat. Yes, but I'm trying to find room to be able to see them. Okay, I was have to stop share for. Uh, okay, I think this is not a question for me, but yes, she's here with me in the room. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I, uh, I have a question that uh, is not exactly in the focus of your uh, expose, but I was wondering, you mentioned that the receptor for the folate was overexpressed in some types of cancer yes. cells. Uh, what kind of cells okay. are there? Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, muscle cells yeah. or uh, okay. blood cells. Thank you. Yeah. There are many types of cancer cells overexpress this receptor. Uh, breast cancer, for sure, urocancer, bladder cancer. Uh, most of the 
solid tumors uh, overexpress this receptor. Uh, the primary reason is that uh, the cancer cells need to feed a lot and folic acid is required for the growth of the cells and for feeding this um, division process. So that's why it is there on many types of cancers. Even, even on bank cancer cells, they register overexpression of this receptor. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the answer.